in today's video, we're going to take a look at Sourcebook and also dive into the code behind it. So Sourcebook is an AI powered app builder, and it's also a Jupyter notebook, but for JavaScript and TypeScript. So I'm in warp now, this is a terminal I'm using, and I'm going to do npx Sourcebook at later start and just get it started running locally. And now it's running at localhost 2150. Now, the first time you launch this, it's going to ask you to add an open AI API key or Anthropic key. I'm using Anthropic for this. And that key is used to run the AI. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a notebook. So let's do generate notebook actually with AI. And we're going to do create an AI agent in Node.js that browses the web and answers questions using LAN chain. So now this is loaded up. You'll notice it's very similar to a Jupyter notebook. I can go in and I can sort of change things. And so each block you can edit as you want here. The AI has just gone and generated all the different blocks. Now you will see it started to write some code for me. So if I try and run it, let's see what happens. Environment set up complete. And you'll see I went and set this before OpenAI API key. So that's why this worked. But let's say I change this over here. Hopefully it will error now. And yeah, you can see it has errored. So let's undo that change. So this is all running on my local machine. Create the web browsing tool. So that's the next step is explaining what it's doing. And here's a web browsing tool. So it's gone to created an, a URL for DuckDuckGo to go search for it and get the results back. Again, this won't actually go and do anything because uh, it's just a class of a function that's being exported or a method and then creating the AI agent. So that's the next one again. Well, this one will actually go and do something. So let's see what goes and happens in this class. You can see we're getting the result. Langchain is being run. The first time you do this, by the way, it will say, hey, these packages aren't installed. So a little toast will pop up in the top right and you just hit install and it will install the packages for you. I can ask a question, who won Euro 2024? I adjusted this a bit and you can go and ask it the question and see what comes out. I'm going to show you one more example before we jump to the app builder. Here you can see intro to WebSockets. This was also fully generated. You can see we're setting up a simple server for WebSockets. So this is also really cool because this is Node.js is obviously not running on the client. It's just going and you can see it's running. And now we're going to do some client code. So let's see what happens here. And you can see this actually logged this piece of server code that's still running. And I'm going to stop this. And here we have stateful connections. And so let's go and do this. We're running it and we're going to run a client. You can see it's actually working like the web sockets are communicating client one, client two. They're all sending stuff to, to each other, shutting down. That's really, really, really cool. So even just that, the, originally the video was just going to be on this part of it. But now what they've released recently is an ability to create your own app. So the first app I went and built was an email client. Here you can see what it looks like. I've actually iterated on this once, but I basically said I want an email client where I can go and categorize my emails. So here you can see the different categories welcome to our service and so on. Let's go and adjust this a little bit. So I'm going to use whisper flow to dictate what I want to have changed. This is a separate app that I could just type this in as well. Could you please add 10 categories and the categories I want are things like newsletters, receipts, marketing, business, you choose the other categories. So let's hit enter. By the way, if you want to use whisper, I, I found it really helpful. I will use, drop my affiliate link in the description below, but a lot of my work these days, instead of me typing, I'm talking to cursor exactly like I just did over here. So this might take a little bit of time till it loads up and you can see it's now finished. So let's put the chat down, categorize, and you can see, well, there's a bit of a bug, but it's done a good job creating all these different categories and it's actually gone and changed it over here, which is really cool. And so let's also click on code here. You'll see the code for the project and then here's handle categorize. And I mean, we can dive in, we can see here's the email list component using loose side react for the icons, giving it different colors, which is really cool. You can see this is a Vite front end that it's using. And yeah, it, it's gone and just built this all itself. I have every line of code that I want, which is super, super cool. And I can talk to it and get changes and so on. Now, before we dive into the code, I just want to show you where this is stored. So you'll notice I was running at localhost 2150 when I ran the MPX command. And here you'll see the ID at the end of the URL. So if I go to dot sourcebook on my computer in the root, you will see that I have an apps folder for the two apps that I created. And then over here, I have the different source books, which are basically the Jupyter notebooks. And you'll notice the ID that ends in FC4, it matches over here. So here we can find the code for that. And you'll see it's a very simple project. And inside the source folder, we'll see the different pieces of code for the web socket. So here is the client.js code, here's simple client and so on. Here's a stateful server that we had. And also for our other apps, like our email app, we would be able to find all the code in here. You can see Tailwind and yeah, you'd basically be able to take this and just run it however you want. 
and the source file itself. So this file that says intro to WebSocket is the source book is a fun demonstration. You'll find this in the readme.md. Here you'll see it as well. It's in Markdown, intro to WebSockets. And then down here, this source book is a fun demonstration. So this file plus this source code over here translates into what we have on screen and what we were able to go and run. Now we understand how to use source book and what the output is. We're going to take a look at the code behind the project. You'll notice it's a turbo repo. It's got a turbo JSON here. They're using PMPM. We have a packages folder and a source book folder. So this is the CLI when you run MPX source book. This could also be put in an apps folder. That's typically what you do with turbo repo. I think it was the team's first time using turbo repo. So that's sort of why it's positioned here. But yeah, it doesn't really make a difference. And then here you see we have a few API packages. Well, a few packages, API, web, shared, and so on, components. And then we have a source book CLI over here. So the CLI is the first place we start to interact with the app. So let's go and take a look at that. We can see in the package JSON, it starts at the CLI.MJS. Looking at the CLI.MTS file, this is basically the entry point for the CLI. So we have this program and we're using commander for this. And the main command is start, start the source book server. So that's the command we use to get started as well. So we can dive in here. Our port is 2150 that it started on. So let's dive into this start server to see how it actually works. That's up here. It's spawning a new Node.js process and that is running source server.mjs. So let's take a look at that. So we're going and running this file. You can see we are creating an HTTP server. We're also creating a WebSocket server. You can see we're starting up a React app. It's going to serve the index.html file over here, running it on port 2150. As we saw, we're using Postog in the CLI to track what's happening. This is for analytics, basically which you typically see in a web app, but here it's being used within the CLI. And now we have the server running at the port we wanted. If we take a look at the app that's actually being run, you'll see this is a public HTML file and you'll see it's in the packages web folder. We're using Vite or Vite, however people say it. We've got Tailwind installed. Uh, here we can take a look at some of the packages. We're using CodeMirror. So that was used quite a lot within the project. So wherever we're showing code, it's using CodeMirror for that. We're using Lucide for icons, we're using Tailwind, Classic Shad CN stack over here, Zord, and so on. What else is interesting that I can show you? And we're using React Top Keys Hook. Here you can see so these are code editors that we're using. And then over here, keyboard shortcuts. If I do like question mark, for example, or I don't know, let's say command semicolon. So these are the hotkeys that are being used. It's like a nice touch to add, it's very clean. CodeMirror is one of the core pieces of the platform. So if you want to take a look, uh, CodeMirror.net, you can see we can edit some code using CodeMirror and it's got syntax highlighting and so on. I think even Replit is using them. So that's pretty big and Prisma and so on. Let's take a look around this app a bit. I mean, I'm not going to dive too much into the front end here. Web is the client and API is the server. You can see we're setting up the server and it's just an express router. We also use WebSockets in a lot of places. If I go to the homepage of the app, you'll see the examples API that is being here and that's just returning some examples. So maybe even we'll take a look at that in the code. So all this is doing is returning some JSON example source books. These are the examples we were getting back to the client. I also see an apps endpoint so that returns some dynamic data. This is the email client that I created. Let's look for the get request. Here you can see we've got the get request. So all we're doing is load apps. So going into that and we're doing DB select, just go and select the apps from our database. And for the database, we're using Drizzle. So let's jump into that Drizzle over here. Drizzle with SQLite 3. And here you can see the schema for our database. So the secrets we're storing in the database, but this is the local database. And then the apps over here. So it has an ID, a name and everything we want. You can see some more get requests. So here we're able to get a specific app using the app's ID endpoint. So this is all pretty clear. And looking at the post request to create the app, we're passing with Zord. If there's an error, I guess return it. Post will capture that event each time we create an app. Now there are two options. If we have a prompt, then we want to create the app with AI. Otherwise, we just want to create the app ourselves. Do we really need to keep this? I'm not even sure there's a non-AI version right now, but anyway, let's jump into create app with AI then. You'll see we're creating the app in the database. We're creating a Vite app or Vite app. What that does is creates the directory it needs and then it scaffolds it. So let's dive into there. And this is already in packages, apps, API apps, and yeah, now in disk.mts. 
So we're going to go and scaffold the app. It's React TypeScript template. Going to write out the different files we need, like a package JSON index.html. We're going to replace the title in the app so to give it a name and write those files to disk. So we've gone and created the app locally, written it to our own machine. And let's dive back because that's actually what appears over here, right? So we've added the package JSON, we've added the index.html. And so that's what we just saw in the code. And I guess the rest of the template, probably files like this are added as well. We're going to initialize a repo. So I guess this is just git in it. It uses simple git to go and do those commands. So yeah, we're just doing git dot in it over here and then we're committing all the files. Now we're going to do an npm install. So let's take a look at this command. What do we do here? We're going to check if we have any running processes. We're going to broadcast with WebSockets that we're busy installing right now. And here we're going to do exec npm install, which is just in exec.mts. And here we're going to do spawn call, but basically we're going to do npm install. Let's just jump into that. Yeah, and we're basically we're running that new command. So, so far, all of that didn't use any AI. I'm going to get the files to the app. We're going to generate the app. So I guess that's the AI part of it. Now we have new packages to install. So let's go do that. And then we're going to return the app. So there we've actually gone and created the app. So let's see that last AI part. That's probably the most interesting part of this remaining code. We're going to get the AI model. Let's say we're using OpenAI. So we'll create OpenAI. This is just using uh, AI SDK OpenAI, but we could use uh, any model we want really. No, you could also do custom. So you API, AI base URL could even be like Olama running locally. If it's a open AI compatible, that would be fine. Here you can see API key is bogus because it doesn't matter when you're running locally. If you want to do custom, yeah, then locally AI base URL has to be set. We have the model. Now we've just got two console logs, but I'm curious what they're logging because this is the make app builder system prompt. And this is going to go and read the file app builder dot text. So this is the prompt and you can see we're going to put our own data into this prompt file. But here you can see lots of different prompts that they're using. Here you can see the instructions they put into the file itself. This helps the AI give a better response because it's giving you example response as well. You can see we want to get a response in XML format. We want to get different packages we need to install, different actions, different files we want to add. I'm going to quickly read through this prompt just to give you an idea. You are helping a user build a front-end website application. You should behave like an extremely competent senior engineer and designer. The user is asking you to create the app from scratch through a... So here's the request and you will be given the skeleton of the app that already exists as a project. You will be given an app skeleton in the following format. So here's the format. So all of the files, contents, and so on. This is the app.tsx that we're also passing in. You will be given the user request passed as user request and the instructions. Your job is to come up with the relevant changes. You do so by suggesting a plan with one or more action and a plan description. There can be one or more action and a plan and so on. So let's look at what that looks like. So we have this plan and then within it, we've got a plan description that needs to be filled in. And then we've got an action, which is like create a file, short justification, like a commit message, the file contents. And now with all of this, we'll be able to go and create the app. Okay, so that's the system prompt that we were using. And now you, the user prompt is make app create user prompt. So we're going to pass it project ID files and the query from the user. Here's the user request. We saw that in the first prompt. Following below are the project XML and the user request. So here's the project XML, the user request XML. And now this is the prompt that the AI is using or in com combination with the first prompt we saw, which was the system prompt. Build project XML. Here you can see all the different files we're getting. And so we're just looping through the, the files basically and passing it to the AI. So we have the prompts. Now we're actually going to go and do generate text. So this is the exact same thing twice. If I set mine up there, I'd make to this code, but why call this function twice? So why not just do like uh, this once and then you change it over here and use it in both places, but this isn't critical. So we have the model, the system, the prompt. Now we can just use the generate text from the AI package to go and actually generate the content we want. So now jumping back to where we were, this is the result. We're going to pass the plan. So now we understand a bit better what the plan is. And now we're going to apply the plan. Pass plan. So you can see we're getting the plan and then we're going to pass it and jump through the different actions that need to be done. An action could be like an NPM install. It could be a file that we need to go and create. And then once we pass the plan, we'll apply the plan. So the different actions, and again, we're going to, if it's a file, we're going to go and write it basically. And 
the npm install isn't happening over here. Oh, but then we're doing get packages to install from the plan and now we can go and do the npm install. So that's how an app is generated and it's just all written to disk locally. That's, you know, a very core part of what they're doing. And when you're chatting to the AI, I mean, I'm not going to dive through into that process, but it's going to be a very similar idea. We're going to pass it, pass it the context of what, of what we already have. And then we're going to ask the AI to adjust based on that. Now I'm going to show you what happens when we run a block of code. So when I hit run over here, what's the process that takes this actually goes and runs it. So in the code base, if we go to exec.mts, we will see a spot where we're running some JavaScript code over here. So it's run as follows. Or if we want to write run TypeScript code, um, we're going to use TSX to run that. So let's say we're doing TSX. I'll go to spawn call and you'll see, but we're basically going and running that TSX command. So we're running node modules, bin TSX, and that will go and run a TypeScript file that we pass in. And same idea over here, but it's even simpler because we're just using Node.js. Now, if we take a look where this is actually used, we'll see it's used in a WebSocket file, ws.mts. Here you can see the JS exec, here's the TSX exec. So this is for TypeScript and it's going and actually running it and creating a running process. If we jump up one level higher, you'll see here exactly what we said, JavaScript or TypeScript. And this is happening in cell exec. Cell exec, you'll see, is called from here. So this is the WebSocket communication we're using. And it's being published to this channel, well, the session channel, whenever cell exec is sent. And if we search for that in the code base, we'll find that here it's one of the outgoing session events that's used. You can see here we're showing the same schema, both on the server and the client, the Zod schema. But this is where it's actually pushed into the channel with the cell ID. And this is in run cell, which is part of controlled code cell. So let's take a look at where run cell is used. It's passed as on run cell, code cell. Here we have it in code cell. And then the last thing that happens, we go into header and you can see we have the run button over here and this is where we run the cell. And here you can see the play icon. So if we take a look at the running app, you'll see that's exactly the button we're after. So now we understand the full process. When I hit run over here, we're gonna send a cell exec event that's going to be put, picked up by the server. That's going to go and take that file that we've already written to disk, representing this over here, that code we see here. This file now needs to be run as a Node.js script. So we're going to go and spawn a new process to go and run that. And that is what happens. So now when we hit this run button, I'm actually going to show you that this is actually happening. I've gone to network tab. I've gone to WS. I'm going to refresh the page so we can see the WebSocket that's loaded. And let's just open this up a bit more so we can see it. Here you can see we've sent a subscribe event. We've got subscribe back. And now what will happen if we hit run over here. So this is going to start running this code. And that's exactly what we expect. Cell exec has been sent and we got back a cell updated event. But yeah, this, uh, this code has now gone and started running. Here you can see the code that we actually are going and running. It's basically this code over here. And so that's how that whole process works. So that's the end of the video. I think this is a really cool project because I mean, it's quite powerful in terms of what it's doing. I'm not familiar of any really good Jupyter notebooks for JavaScript or TypeScript, and this can run everything front end code, back end code, and it can also go and generate a full app for us. And we've understood quite well how that all works. We've understood the flow of the Jupyter notebook or the source book, I guess is what we should call it. It was safe to disk. We just run it, ran it on our own computer. We understood the flow of how the app was generated using an LLM. Overall, I really like this project because it does look like quite a complex app to build, but we've really understood pretty quickly how the code behind it works. So that's really nice and well done to the developers for creating this. And I'm excited to see where this project goes moving forward. Some final words. I'm sure they'd be happy if you give them a start on GitHub. And I'd also love it if you gave my project a start, Inbox Zero. It's an email app that helps you be more efficient with email. It's got a personal assistant. Here you can go and write your own prompt how you want your personal assistant to handle your email for you. And it's also got a really cool tool called Bark and Subscriber, which helps you quickly get rid of all the junk in your inbox that you never want. Subscribe to the channel if you want more about open source. Every week I dive into the code behind a different project. Enjoy.